simply of recent onset. You don't know, I, I think in my whole career, I saw one case of this. So it's not commonly seen in the U.S. Skin TB that can be presented with warty lesions, papulonecrotic lesions, lupus vulgaris, erythema nodosum may be a sign of tuberculin hypersensitivity. Renal TB it's often presents with steropyuria or hematuria, blood in the urine, and TB of the eye, which goes iritis, optic neuritis, um, and conjunctivitis. But if you look at these pediatric cases by site of disease, you see by far the, the extra pulmonary sites that are most common is by far the lymphatic, the cervical, the, what we call scrofula, 18.8%. The extra are, are lymphatic, with meningeal being about the second most common. But again, not very, 3.4% of the TB cases in these very young children. You see pulmonary to the left, the pie chart, over 70% is pulmonary, and then the rest are, ex those are extra pulmonary, and of the extra pulmonary sites, the two most common are the lymphatic and the meningeal. Tuberculosis in adolescents. Adolescents develop tuberculosis in one of two ways. One, it could be reactivation of an infection acquired when they were children. And the closer to puberty at the time of infection, the greater the risk of activation. Okay? And that often presents as chronic pulmonary tuberculosis. And, or then you can have progression of infection, the second way, acquired during adolescence to disease. And that can present as the classic primary disease, progressive primary pulmonary TB, or chronic. For reactivation tuberculosis, the constitutional symptoms are often more prominent than the respiratory. So, they, um, so you, these are the kids you might put. These are the ones where you ask about the drenching night sweats, the chronic weight loss, and the fever. Chronic weight, uh, weight loss and fever that are very common. You'll find they have drenching night sweats and cough and chest pain and hemoptysis are certainly other clues to this. This may be one of the most important slides of, the, of this whole presentation. What's the significance of TB in children? It's a diagnosis of latent TB, and I had referred to this earlier, or active TB in a child is considered a sentinel public health event, usually representing recent transmission. Remember, they're too young. They didn't get it 20 years ago because they're only three years old. So they obviously were recently exposed, which means there's ongoing transmission in your community. So even though you may not suspect it in your school, if you are the first person who becomes aware of it, it's certainly something you have to notify the public health authorities in your locale so that they some missed opportunities in preventing TB in children, failure to find and appropriately manage that adult source that I just talked. Case finding, very important. Um, if you don't find them, they can continue to transmit TB in the community, and we may see more morbidity um, from the disease. Uh, delay in reporting the initial diagnosis of TB. I don't know why it would be a secret.
So let's talk about targeted TB. I remember when I was a kid, we used to get time tests. And every couple of years, everybody would line up and they'd stick us with the little prong. Well, they found out that wasn't very effective. Um, so now we've gone to something called, by the way, nobody uses that type. If, if you so happen to have one, you probably can go on eBay and sell it as an antique because nobody has used that particular testing for a long time. So why not? Why didn't? Why don't we use what we used to use, where you test everybody? I, I forgot what was that kindergarten, first grade, or something like that, where we, every kid was tested. Because since we are really in an area of low endemicity, even a positive test is likely to be false positive, even if the test has excellent specificity. In an area of very low prevalence, the positive test is probably a false positive, which will lead to tons of investigations uh, which are not going to reveal anything. So what we're trying to do is, and I hate to say it's sort of like profiling, is to find groups that are really at high risk and test those particular kid persons, and in this case, children. So target, it's a risk assessment. Who would you target? Obviously, people who have signs and symptoms consistent with TB. Um, any uh, contact and source, I'm not sure, contact and source case investigations. Um, the risk, this is what you're trying to find. Uh, and you'd be able to identify people who have at least, at least one risk factor um, for screening on these uh, you may have a formal questionnaire, you may not. I think the state does have one. So there is one for the state. This is usually done in general pediatric practices. I'm not aware you may do it in your schools, but um, I'm not aware. I, the, that, I don't know how that works, but you could do it in the school if you're not. And um, it identifies kids who may be at high risk for progression due to underlying conditions, which we talked about previously. And just a short word, con uh, control of TB in the United States is based on contact investigations. And as I showed you, there's a declining incidence in pre uh, of TB in the United States in not only adults but in children. And it's because of these methods. And these are contact investigations. They can be complex. They can require lots of detective work. Nobody's asking you to do it. But we have this wonderful TB center in the state. That's why they have to be notified so they can investigate that. And that's where they contact the uh, source case, and then they test people who are at high risk around the source case. So the high priority contacts that they will test are people living in the household of, a, of an index case, uh, children under five years old who may become in contact with, those, with that case, um, people with high risk conditions, and so forth. These are difficult to do, and we have hardened and professionals here at the TP Center who actually do do them, and so as does the state. So that's why it's important to contact your public health authorities if you find a case of TB. The targeted TB testing risk assessment, uh, it's fairly obvious. We can go through this quickly. And it essentially asks you, has a family member or contact had TB disease? Has a family member had a positive TB test? And was your child not only born, but had they visited a high-risk country? Um, and if they have, they, they will probably be asked. I usually, in my practice, if I see kids, I see a lot of kids, but they were born in the U.S., but their parents weren't. They often visit their home countries. I often find in September, when they all come back from summer vacation, where they spent at any, many places in the world, I often will test them on their return because, because they very well may have been exposed.
I don't know that this, I put this in, using the risk assessment questionnaire, uh, usually at first contact with a child and every six months until two years. Uh, if you feel that the child, you know, has a risk factor, uh, after age two years, you could use the risk assessment. Now, and most of those risk factor, again, is born or visiting a foreign country, I mean a country uh, where of high-end um, TB endemicity. Um, Another question is, is somebody visiting you from a country with high endemicity? And, oh, by the way, do they have a bad cough? So these are the things that you would look at. Okay. Now, this always comes up. There's a lot of confusion um, often about when to use the tuberculin TST or tuberculin skin test or what's called uh, or the IGRA, uh, the interferon gamma release assay. Um, the TST you're all familiar with, that's where you take the needle, you go intradermally, you have the little bump, you have them come back in two days, and you start feeling around their arm for, a ra for an induration, not just erythema, remember for induration. And then you have the criteria, if it's 5 millimeters, 10, 15, and so forth. IGRA is a newer technology where it's a blood draw. They don't have to return, I mean, they should return for the reason be told the result, but this is, and then you stimulate the uh, lymphocytes with uh, um, tuberculin antigen, and if those lymphocytes react, that would be a positive. That's simply how you explain it. Um, so where would you use these tests? It's, uh, it's not quite clear. So in, in the, the group of people you would use where the TST is preferred, and the IGRA is acceptable is in ch or children under five years of age. So you'd probably use the TST first. Now, a positive result of either test is considered significant as TB exposure. Now, in uh, situations where an IGRA is preferred but the TST is acceptable is in children greater than five or years of age or greater who have received BCG vaccine. The IGRA is not going to react to BCG where the TST might. And children of, of at least five years of age who are unlikely to return for TST testing. So if you think you're going to put it on the kid and then it's the last time you're going to see them until they're in high school, it's probably better to do the IGRA. TST and IGRA should be considered together if the initial and repeat IGRA are indeterminate. Then you may want to put on a TST. The initial test is negative, a TST or IGRA, and you still have a real clinical suspicion for TB. Or the risk of progression in this particular person um, uh, and poor and, and uh, a resulting poor outcome is very high. You may then want to do the other test if the first test is negative. And the, uh, you may want to use NIGRA in addition to TST if the initial TST is positive and the child is greater than five years of age with a history of BCG vaccination. You need additional evidence needed to increase compliance. In other words, the parents are not sure, they're not convinced by the TST, whatever, and you want to show, here's another test, and it's showing the positivity. Or non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease is suspected. Remember, the TST will respond in case to non-tuberculin TB, non-tuberculosis, um, uh, non-tuberculous mycobacterial disease, a, what are they often called atypical mycobacteria. The TST may be positive in the case of an infection with that, and it's not TB. The IGRA will not. So you may want to use an IGRA if you expect atypical mycobacterial disease. The limitations, both the TST and the IGRA by themselves cannot distinguish between infection or latent TB infection and disease. In circumstances of moderate to high clinical suspicion for TB disease, negative results in either the TST and IGRA do not exclude the diagnosis. And before this uh, meeting, uh, before our, our um, webinar, we were talking amongst ourselves, and we were talking about a recent TB meningitis case we had in New Jersey where the clinical presentation was so consistent with TB. However, the TST and IGRA, the TST was negative 
all this, and the IGRA was a determinant, but we were so convinced it was TB, we persisted, and we, it was actually true. Um, two months after the fact, it did, TB did grow out of the CSF. Um, so if you think they have TB, move, keep, you know, keep on fighting for that diagnosis despite the TST and the IGRA times. Uh, the IGRA should not be used in children under two years of age unless, again, TB disease is suspected. In children two through four years of age, there's limited data about its usefulness in determining TB, um, but it can be performed if, again, you, th you really think disease is suspected. Uh, children with positive IGRA results should be considered infected with MTB complex. A TST results may be confounded by previous BCG administration and infection with non-tuberculous mycobacteria. We talked about that. And indeterminate IGRA results do not exclude TB infection and may necessitate repeat testing. Okay? So it shouldn't be used exclusively to make clinical decisions. Um, microbacteriologic uh, diagnosis of TB, adults generally 70, 90 to 90% have a sputum that is positive for MTB if they have pulmonary TB. Why? They carry much higher loads of TB. They often have cavitary disease. Um, um, TB, t tuberculin, uh, TB like bears like to live in caves. And so if you have a cavity, that's what it is. That's filled with TB. They're much more likely to produce a sputum that's positive. Children, again, tuberculobacilli are relatively few in number. Sputum generally cannot be obtained from children, especially those 10 years of age and less. Gastric, we often resort to gastric aspirates in children with pulmonary TB. That has a 30 to 40 percent sensitivity in children. However, it's much more sensitive in infants, 60 to 70 percent. And bronchialveolar lavage, BAL, sensitivity may be actually less than those in gastric aspirates. Now, I know there's certain um, technology, in, hopefully in the near future, that's going to even better our um, uh, acumen for diagnosis, for increase our sensitivity in detecting TB in young children. So uh, with everything I'm saying, what I'm essentially saying is establishing a definitive diagnosis of TB disease in children is often associated with great difficulty. But you are fortunate to live in the Garden State where we have a wonderful TB center and we have uh, physicians and people who are fairly fam are familiar with the disease. So if you ever have a question, do not hesitate to refer them. Uh, and then just quickly to finish, treatment of latent TB infection, uh, INH, isoniazid, 10 to 15 mg per kg, maximum 300 milligrams, PO daily for 270 doses, which eventually means essentially nine months, and efficacy with this approach is 100%. The alternative is twice weekly with the uh, directly observed therapy, which Lillian will be speaking to you shortly about, and that's INH 20 to 40 mg per kg with a maximum of 900 milligrams for 72 doses. Uh, the monitor index case, uh, uh, you, might, you have to monitor the index case to isolate sensitivities. Again, children often, especially with LTBI, you often do not get back a bacteria. However, if you know their exposure and they do have the sensitivities to that person's bug, that's what you follow. Um, hepatotoxicity, which is the major um, um, adverse effect from INH, is very rare in children. Um, it increases the more drugs you use. So, for instance, if they have disease, uh, the other medications, which we'll talk about in the next slide, um, can increase your rate of hepatotoxicity. But essentially, it's very rare in children. Um, you really need to go back one. What's important is that they may be seen monthly for clinical evidence. They don't have to be followed with blood draws for LFTs. Um, and you look for, in those cases, malaise, loss of appetite or weight, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, jaundice. Often as school nurses, you're the first people who may come in contact with. So if you know a child is taking INH or tuberculin drugs and you find that they're coming down explaining that, immediately refer them to the proper uh, medical people. Um, and as I said, routine monitoring of LFTs is not indicated. 
Go ahead. And treatment, um, oh, the other re regimens, that's the regimen, the most common one I just spoke of, but is rifampin, 10 to 15 mg per kg per day, max 600 milligrams, PO daily for six months as an alternative. This is in people who INH is not tolerated, but most children tolerate it, and I like INH. And the, if you find that the index patient isolate with INH resistant, you may refer to this. There's rifpentine and INH. It's a 12-week course. However, this is only for children, for adolescents, 12 years and over. Um, the question if they, the person has MDR uh, LTBI or XDR LTBI, um, I would still treat it. Treatment can reduce risk of disease. And, uh, um, and you try to figure a regimen, the best regimen based on susceptibilities. Uh, treatment of TB in children and adolescents, we can go on for days on this, however, I'll just briefly. If INH resistant rate is greater than 4% or if other risks for resistance include four drugs in the initial regimen, which include isoniazid, rifampin, pyrazinamide, and ethambulstol, uh, Treatment is often, especially in very young children, complicated by child-unfriendly preparations and medications. As per usual, they don't make meds for kids. They make meds for adults because that's where the money is, right? Use directly observed therapy, which uh, uh, Lillian will be speaking to about in just moments. Um, what, should you monitor liver transaminase? It depends on the severity of disease. It depends on the amount of medications. Again, I said the more medications used, the greater the risk of hepatotoxicity. Uh, that's up to the clinician. They'll have to look and follow and do what they feel is right. And again, follow susceptibility studies of the MTB isolate. Okay? And that's my portion. So uh, I think we'll have time for questions later. Yes. But right now, I'd like, oh, I'm sorry, Frank. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Wenger, and uh, please, again, remember to hold your questions to the end. Uh, of course, if you do have a question for Dr. Wenger, you may go ahead and type that in using the Q&A box at the top of your screen, and we'll get that question over to Dr. Wenger, and we can address that at the end of this uh, presentation. So without delay, let me uh, introduce... Once again, Lillian Parag, who is the Director of Nursing at the uh, Ladmore Clinic, and she's here today to talk about directly observed therapy in schools. Lillian? Thank you, Frank. I would like to um, actually thank Dr. Peter Wanger for his presentation, and hopefully this follows in terms of once the doctor sees the child, does the evaluation, and prescribes the medication, then it's up to you as a healthcare provider. And I always say the nurses have the hardest jobs because now you have to get the child and the family to adhere to the treatment. And it sounds simple, but with children, not always that easy. So I want to give a shout out to all you school nurses because you have been a big help to us here with um, treating some of our uh, children. So what I'm going to talk about is how factors that can influence the adherence to the TB meds and some strategies that maybe will assist you in overcoming the barriers so you can achieve success in treatment. You've been hearing this term DOT. What does that mean? It's called directly observed therapy. And it involves either a healthcare worker or an outreach worker watching the patient swallow the anti-TB medications. And directly observed therapy is a standard of care for TB disease and should be used with any intermittent treatment. I think um, Dr. Wanger presented the rifapentine and how we can medicate the children twice weekly. That definitely needs to be done under directly observed therapy. Where can directly observed therapy be done? It, it can be done many places. Um, here's a list of a few places. We've provided DOT in many of these settings, either the home, the home of the babysitter, if the child's being cared for by a babysitter, a daycare, school, um, health department, or workplace. It can be supervised by either a physician, a health department nurse, a trained outreach worker, or the school nurse. It should not be supervised by a parent or a close family member. Factors that may affect adherence. Reactions to medication administration vary, and it depends on many things. Many times it's the length of the medicine treatment. 
It could be the relationship with the caregiver or the person administering the meds. It could be due to medication side effects, things like nausea, or as we mentioned earlier, the bitter taste from the medication. It's not appealing to children, and it's um, hard for them to take the medication sometimes. Reactions of others to them taking the medication. And you've got to keep in mind that children with tuberculosis many times don't really feel that sick, yet they're expected to take the medication daily for about six to nine months. These are some general tips to remove some of the barriers to adherence. The main thing I find is to try to administer the medication at the same time every day. It's a mental clue for the child to know when they're supposed to come to the office, especially you as school nurses, to get their medication. You want to be pediatric friendly. You have to remember children are not little adults. Children are children. So you want to start off on a very positive note. Praise them for any efforts they do with cooperation. Just last week, we had two young children in the same family where the parents had to crush the medicine to get the child to take the medicine. When they came in clinic, I did a little extra work with the two children, five and six, and I was able to teach them how to take the pill and swallow the medication, and the parents were so happy. You want to avoid distractions. Try to do your DOT in a quiet area, a quiet part of the room. And you want to ignore behaviors that may interfere with the administration. Keep in mind that it usually takes somewhere about two weeks before the child's really able to take the medication without any difficulty. And there are certain things you can do to help with the administration. We recommend keeping it to the smallest amount possible. You can get the four, if it's a child with TB disease, you, can, you should be able to get the four TB medications in a total volume of five to ten NLs, and we've been able to do that. Many times we're called in to consult with problems with children adhering to the treatment or having problems where they're vomiting, and sometimes it just has to do with reducing the volume. Pills need to be crushed into a fine powder, and I think on the side they're demonstrating you can use two spoons to crush the uh, pills. Um, if you're using Rifamp and the capsule can be opened and the powder added to the crushed pills. One of the keys we've found to be very helpful is to dissolve the medicine with very warm water, about 5 ml, mixed to the granules. It will dissolve the granules. And then the main key is to add the medication to a food that the child likes. Surprisingly, not all children like applesauce. So you really want to find out what, what that child likes. You could add it to fruit, yogurt, to juice, anything the child likes. This, I, I added this slide because this occurred just recently. This was a very innovative child, a uh, child nurse in South Jersey where she was having difficulty with the directly observed therapy. So what she decided to do is melt chocolate, let it cool, because you don't want the chocolate really hot when you pour it into the medication cup, and she made actual lollipops for the child with the medicine in it, and she was able to get total adherence from the child for the medication. Um, assess for adverse reactions. We count on you, as Dr. Wanger said, as nurses to really evaluate this. You want to ask some questions. You want to see if the child's having any abdominal pain. Has the child had any problems with nausea or vomiting? Vomiting is different than spitting up, so keep that in mind. If you're giving the medicine, and we see a lot of that in pediatrics, and you're giving it and the child's spitting it back to you, that's not vomiting. That's really spitting up. Vomiting's different. Is the, is the child having a loss of appetite? Is the child fatigued? Has the child noticed a rash? Not um, something that they persistently have as a rash, something new. You want to ask them, are they taking any other medications besides the TB meds? Has there been a change in their appetite, and what's the color of their urine? DOT in the school setting, there's some basics you need to know. The parents need to sign a consent or an agreement, and every school district has their own agreement that has to be signed. Key we find with the children and the families is maintaining confidentiality. Do the DOT in a private area in the school. You want to make sure your communication between the school and the physician is strong because you want to be able to report any problems to the physician. Things like 
absences, frequent absences from school, we need to be aware of that, or any adverse reactions to the medication. You also have to record on a DOT log and monitor the adherence rates. We need to document that the child's getting their medication. Variables that, and I've worked with a lot of the school nurses, we have a lot of good references, one of which you'll see later on in the school nurse handbook. But I found with nurses, school nurses, one of the concerns was that they may have to cover more than one school. So they may be half a day in one school and half a day in another school. Or if they're off or sick for whatever reason, they may not have backup coverage for that school. So we need to be aware of that. Sometimes nurse, school nurses have reported to me that there's poor communication between their office and the attendance office, so they weren't being notified that a child was absent from school. So what was recommended is ask the parents to call the school nurse directly regarding any absences. Timing. You want to work with the child to find the best time for the directly observed therapy. One of the high schools in Essex County, the school nurse was having a difficult time with getting the children in the office for the medication. When we had a meeting with the school nurse and some of the students, we found that they preferred not taking their medication at lunchtime, but preferred to come in the morning for directly observed therapy. And the comment from the student was that, Lunchtime is his only free time, and he wanted to spend that with his friends. Extended absences, things like suspension, and that also has occurred. The health department needs to, first of all, get a copy of the school calendar to identify holidays and when the school will be closed, and also have to be notified if a child is absent from school. Therefore, the DOT can be done at the home. Other things that can affect the DOT could be maybe multiple social problems in the home, or just peer pressure. That's very important in adolescents, that peer pressure can be an issue with adherence. Some of the DOT challenges could be a lack of cooperation from the parent or the school, mainly because of the stigma attached with tuberculosis. Um, you may have an older child who may be refusing the meds. You need to identify why are they refusing the meds. Is it that they're having side effects on the medication? Or as I said earlier, it could just be the timing and when the medication is being given. So you really have to address that. And this is the end of my presentation. I want to thank everyone. These are two excellent resources. The Tuberculosis Handbook for School Nurses, and you can get it on the website. And this is another good reference, Managing Multidrug Resistant TB in Children. And thank you all. Okay, thank you, Lillian. Let me introduce the last speaker of today, which is uh, Karen Galinowski, and she's here from the New Jersey Department of Health to discuss uh, state guidelines regarding TB testing in schools. schools. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to uh, tell you that we've been looking at these guidelines um, over the last month, and uh, we will be uh, making a few changes going forward for the next school year, and that's why these weren't sent out in, in June as in other years. So you'll get them prior to the school year. There won't be substantial changes, but hopefully clarifications in some areas where it's a little bit nebulous. Okay, so we've had these school testing guidelines in place since 1990, uh, and I wanted uh, to tell you that these are the Department of Education's um, guidelines. Uh, we give our recommendations to the Department of, Ed of Education, but they are responsible for enforcing uh, what um, these, these say, okay, for admission of students and, and employees for New Jersey schools. We don't, the, the New Jersey Department of Health TV program does not enforce these. The purpose is really twofold. The first purpose is to, of these guidelines is to identify new students and employees working greater or equal to 20 hours a week who are at the highest risk of latent TB infection, as Dr. Wanger had um, talked about, so that they can receive treatment for latent TB infection and prevent the development of TB disease at a later time during the school year. Uh, the second is uh, to identify those um, through a symptom assessment who may have TB disease, but it's really the primary one is to prevent development of TB disease. These recommendations restrict TB screening in New Jersey schools to teachers and other employees, 
and only those students who are at the highest risk for latent TB infection. We don't do general uh, screening for all students on entrance to school. And Dr. Wanger had talked about targeted testing. Uh, the CDC and New Jersey Department of Health TB program do not recommend TB screening for the general population, including school employees and students, because it's uh, basically useless for us to do so. Knowledge of the result of the TB test provides no benefit to the school without treatment for latent TB infection. Because we're not doing the test to identify disease, we're doing it for a latent TB infection. And the decision to do the skin test is a decision to treat. So it's very important that all those that are positive on a, on a, a TB test are referred for medical evaluation and treatment. Rate of false tuberculin skin testing increases in proportion to the decreased risk for latent TB infection, as Dr. Wanger discussed earlier. So targeted tuberculosis testing is recommended to detect persons with LTBI who would benefit from TB treatment, de-emphasize testing of groups that are not in the high-risk group, kids that are U.S.-born, um, but children who come from foreign-born countries with a high incidence of TB or whose parents come from a high incidence country and uh, may be at risk for development of TB disease are the ones we really want to find. It also, targeted testing reduces the waste of resources in prevention of inappropriate treatment because we all know there are certain false positives in, in areas of low incidence of TB. So what are the requirements for TB testing for students? Uh, these requirements pertain to two groups of students only. Those born in a country where there is a high incidence of TB who are entering school in the U.S. for the first time, regardless of the age. And second, students transferring into a New Jersey school system directly from a country with a high in incidence of TB, regardless of age or grade. Those coming in from, say, Peru in um, January during the school year. Those would need to get those students would need to get tested. As an example, there are uh, and, and there are some exceptions. Um, TB testing is not required if the student has attended school in another state prior to entering the New Jersey school system. Other some other states do do testing, and students entering grades preschool through five. TB is not testing is not required if the student has a documented TB test at the age of three years or older, regardless of the test. Students entering grades 6 through 12, TB testing is not required if the student has a documented negative TB test in the last six months or a positive test, regardless of when the test was done. So we're talking about a six-month period of time for the test. And the Office of the uh, Attorney General has ruled that there are uh, religious exemptions for TB skin testing in schools. Any student with parents claiming religious exemptions cannot be compelled to submit to this test. And each school district is responsible for obtaining documentation of the religious exemption. It's a TB8 form. Um, an idea that they don't want to be tested or any you know, moral uh, decision that the parents have that it's the wrong test is not acceptable. It has to be uh, documented relig religious exemption and all the schools have policies on how to obtain this. In lieu of a TB test, a, an assessment for TB symptoms must be done and documented and the school nurse uh, is responsible for a symptom assessment. Um, and completion of an assessment form, a TB5 form, uh, and a chest x-ray if necessary. If TB symptoms are identified, a medical evaluation to rule out active disease is, it must be completed and documented. You would send the child to one of our chest clinics and uh, keep the child out of school until the medical evaluation was completed. Employees are also required to have a skin test, uh, those that work uh, 20 hours per more per month uh, in the school. A TB test is required for all newly hired 
full and part-time employees, student teachers, school bus drivers, and other persons who may um, contract um, with, uh, you know, the school for, for those number of hours per month. Now, this, all these tests, including new employees, is a, a one-time test. It's not a two-step. It's only a one-time test because we do not do serial testing of any students or employees in the school. New employees, of course, there are exceptions also. New employees, student teachers, and contractors who have a documented negative TB test result within the last six months or a positive TB test regardless of when the test was done. Same for students. Second, employees transferring between school districts or from a non-public school within New Jersey with a documented TB test result upon his or her initial employment in a New Jersey school. And the religious exemptions for employees are the same for students. Okay, so with TB testing, as we talked about earlier, uh, an interferon gamma release assay is a blood test, is acceptable, or a Mantu tuberculin skin test is acceptable for TB testing in schools. It's really important that school nurses are competent in the Mantu tuberculin skin testing administration and reading. And if you have any questions uh, about your own competency or need any training, we, we need to be sure that you get that either through the county local health department or a special training that's set up. We've done uh, TST trainings for uh, large school districts in the past for school nurses. Uh, to do a MANTU test and, and administer it uh, in a wrong way or to read it, to read erythema or um, the redness, uh, is, is not a good thing because you're reading a positive and then they'll be referred to one of our chest clinics and then we'll have to repeat it. So you really have to be sure that you understand how to read it. CDC has an excellent um, DVD on administration and reading that, can, that you can get. And also it's important to have uh, a millimeter ruler for reading. I've run into many situations where nurses, school nurses didn't have one available. so. Uh, you have to be sure that you read it correctly because we're talking about a positive uh, result requiring a, a chest x-ray and treatment for a child, and we don't want to make a mistake on reading. There are two acceptable AGRA tests, which are the Quantiferon TV Gold or T-Spot. Both are excellent tests. And a positive EGRA indicates the likely presence of MTB. It excludes BCG, so uh, it really is a great test for those children who have received BCG in their country of origin and now are coming into the U.S. A 10 millimeter or greater tuberculin skin test is considered a positive reaction. Unless the child, of course, is immunocompromised, then we may want to use a 5 millimeter. We would use a 5 millimeter. Uh, cutoff point, but most in most cases, we would look at the 10. Um, the, the, the difficulty with getting the IGRA, which is really a, a better test for those born in another country with BCG, is the cost factor. And um, many uh, students don't have insurance coverage as of yet, and, and so it becomes cost prohibitive. The, the follow-up of a positive IGRA or, t or TST is, is a chest x-ray and medical evaluation to rule out active disease. Students, employees, contractors with a positive IGRA test do not have to be held out of school or work until the medical evaluation and chest x-ray is done, provided there are no TB symptoms. We get many calls about this, and it's not required, and there are no, there should be no policies within your school holding these students out. Sometimes it takes a, a, a week or a month to get kids medically evaluated in the chest clinics, especially when it's busy in September, October, November. They may not be able to get an appointment for a month. Uh, and we don't want these kids sitting at home and not going to school or teachers. So the symptom assessment is really the key here. Um, if the student employee, uh, as I said, should never be excluded from school unless symptomatic. 
It is the responsibility of the school nurse to obtain the results of a chest X-ray and medical evaluation, prescribe treatment and treatment outcomes for LTBI, and retain this information on site in the student's record. Any assistance we, you, that you could provide for DOT, for LTBI, or for um, children with TB disease is really helpful to prevent, for LTBI to prevent TB disease in your school and for, for, um, for kids with TB disease to ensure that treatment is, is completed in the least invasive way. Uh, a lot of times kids don't get home from school till later and the school is often the best place to do DOT. Of course, as Lillian said, parental consent is important, but also the child's buy-in and child's agreement uh, for DOT at the school is very important. Parents say, yes, I absolutely want it. The child say, no, I don't want anyone to know, I'm afraid, or maybe they have an issue uh, with the school health program or uh, leaving their classmates. So the child's uh, agreement is really important in this situation also. And as the, old, the older the child, the more opinions they have, of, as you would know, with teenagers. So um, we had one t uh, kid fa failing on adherence, failing to take treatment because the the school nurse that was arranged for the DOT to be done during lunch hour. Well, that kid didn't want to leave his friends at lunch, so he wouldn't go down to see the school nurse. So the child's uh, time, the child really has to determine with the school nurse when and how it's going to be done and where. You need doctor's orders. Once the doctor orders DOT, you're obligated to give DOT as a nurse unless you can talk the doctor out of it. So it's very important that you have this dialogue with the chest clinic, the nurse case managers, and the physician. Uh, the DOT form that is, um, is important for you to document that DOT was provided and then fax to the chest clinic monthly, and then you need the medications in the school provided by the chest clinic. So uh, we talked about evaluation of symptoms. This is probably the, one of the most important things you can do as a school nurse. Yes, tuberculin skin test, is, as we say, doesn't identify this TB disease. Uh, we're looking for latent TB infection. But the symptom assessment will tell you a lot about TB disease. And it's important to, to do the symptom assessment and document using our form that we have on our website. At the time of the TST, administration or reading for IGRA. We may have one chance with the IGRA. If you send the kid for an, um, an IGRA to a lab, the parents are willing to have insurance and they're willing to go to a laboratory for this. You have to be sure uh, that prior to sending this kid out, you do a symptom assessment. Anyone with symptoms of pulmonary TB should be medically evaluated regardless of the result of the IGRA skin test and excluded from school until TB disease is ruled out. And remember the symptoms that Dr. Wanger had talked about. And the older the children, and the 5 to 10, you're probably not going to see any. Uh, it's the teenagers that you're going to see. Um, absence from school, cough, um, uh, going to see the doctor a couple of times with a cough, respiratory, frequent respiratory tract infections, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, so the symptom assessment, TB5, can be found on our website uh, and exclude any kid with symptoms and refer. So we used to have more reporting requirements uh, over the years, but, and, and you used to have to send them to the New Jersey Department of Health TB program. But right now, we're, you're no longer required to submit the annual report, which is the TB57, to our department in Trenton. You should be kept keep this up to date and on site in each school and you could send a copy to the, you should send a copy to the superintendent in the county TB program. The report is for each current school year and should only include testing from that period. All of these forms can be found on the TB website under forms tab and here's our website. I'm sure you all are familiar with it and if not, you can contact us. Uh, tuberculosis testing outcomes should be completed in certain time frames. 
We're asking if no TV testing is required and no or no significant reactors identified submitted by 115 16 or keep it in your office by then. Uh, if TV testing is done and significant reactors identified, we'll want to give time for follow-up. But the sooner you can do this in the school year, the better. And, and also take, um, take care of those children immigrating into our country and entering your school year in a timely fashion um, as they enter school. The first one is, can a chest x-ray be substituted for a TV test? Yes, provided the physician agrees. Yes, if the school has written policies related to this test. Yes, only in the case of religious exemption. And no, a chest x-ray has to be done. So, the correct answer is only in the case of a religious exemption. Uh, there are some physicians, I do, do note that it says, um, that a physician can decide if the parents refuse. There's really no reason why a parent should refuse a tuberculin skin test or IGRA. Uh, and uh, the school should not have written policies uh, relating to anything other. And, uh, a, yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Wenger. Oh, okay. So Dr. Wenger would like to comment on this. No, I would just like to caveat. Um, Remember, a chest X-ray will not tell you if a person is latent TB infection. It will be absolutely normal. And uh, as Karen mentioned earlier, one of the important things is to identify latent TB infection in schools. Just a chest X-ray without further evaluation with TST or NIGRA will not identify latent TB infection. See, one of the biggest problems, Dr. Wanger, is that the kids will go to their private pediatrician, and the pediatrician won't test them because they've had BCG. And then the school nurses have had to take the chest X-ray uh, that instead. So, what do you think should be done in those situations? I think we should give more of these to the pediatrician, to the doctors around this state, <laughs> so they know. I mean, no, I understand that's true. Regardless. Uh, chest x-ray, if you have latent TB infection, it's going to be normal. And, in fact, chest x-rays are often difficult to read if you don't have a lot of experience with TB, especially in children. So you really have to find people who know how to read them to really tell you yeah. if it's honestly. But, regardless, the greatest radiologist in the universe can tell you <clears throat> that a person has latent TB infection by your chest x-ray alone. If I, I think we're here as a resource. Um, if the nurse has any, in, you know, is concerned about what happened in the duct, she should call here. If we have TB, no, we do have TB clinics around the city, right? There's mm -hmm. several of them. And send the child there. Mm -hmm. But to not give the appropriate screening test is just incomplete. I, you know, uh, it doesn't matter who ordered it or who said not to. Um, it's just not complete. Uh, I would never say a child doesn't have an HTV. Here's a chest x-ray. Okay, where's the TST or the IGRA? Well, they didn't do it. Uh, yeah, I don't know. And in, in uh, the regional chest clinics, we do have the IGRA available for uh, contact uh, cases and school-age children. So if you run into the situation where the, pedi the private pediatrician refuses to give the test, you could say, I'd like you to go have a blood test, which is uh, a non-invasive for uh, anything being put in your arm, but will rule out BCG and, and anything else, and it's more accurate. So I, we know that it's difficult uh, in what you're up against as school nurses in dealing with private doctors. but. Um, and remember, the purpose of the skin testing policy is to identify those kids with latent TB infection. Okay, are students coming in from another U.S. state or a city in the United States required to receive a TB test? Great, no. Okay. Yes, they might have lived in a city with a high number of TB cases. Okay, the answer is number two. No, the school TB testing program is focused on students born in high TB incidence countries who are entering school in New Jersey for the first time. Oh, we, that, that, you did great on that. 
okay? Are students returning from vacation or travel out of the country required to have a TB test before entering school? This happens a uh, question we get a lot of. Um, you know, kids leaving for summer vacation, going for a month or two, and coming back in. And uh, he did a great job on this. The answer is no. There's no need to retest these students unless there was known TB exposure during the travel vacations or TB symptoms. Uh, once again, um, you have to ask a question. You know, who would you see in another country? Were there any family members that had TB? And this would be a question for parents if you're concerned. Okay, and the last question is, a student came from a high-incidence country and started school before the TST or AGRA was done. The child relocated to your school. Should the TST be done by your school and by you, the second school? And the answer is great. You all got it. Yes, the second school needs to do the TST and followed up. So and now we have questions for all of us. Frank? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, at this time we will open the floor to uh, questions and comment or comments. And uh, please remember that if you have a question, uh, press the pound six uh, buttons and then go ahead and introduce yourself. We'd like to know who you are and uh, go ahead and ask your question. We do have some folks here in the studio audience as well, so they may we may get some questions here internally, maybe to break the ice. Uh, okay. Um, Dr. I'll, Al. Uh, Al Lardizabal, uh, Global TB Institute. Um, thanks for a great talk, and, uh, um, and I, I refreshed. Uh, with, I'm now um, familiar again with the regulations that the schools have to be uh, uh, addressing with regards to TB testing and treatment. Uh, comment and question. Uh, uh, I think uh, with regards to TB testing, I think for, for those who are out there listening, it's important to really uh, look at the, the idea of TB as a, a risk assessment and uh, start with understanding, uh, you know, how you go about assessing risk for infection and then move to test. I think that's, uh, that's really an important aspect of targeted testing. Who's at risk and who should I test? And, and then move from there. So go, coming from a city doesn't, um, doesn't give you any, uh, any uh, uh, perspective of risk. Uh, contact to a case, sure. Uh, those, are, those are the things that I think the listeners should uh, understand. Um, uh, one of the more important aspects of TB elimination moving forward, I think uh, very important for all of you to understand this, is really addressing latent TB infection uh, effectively. And uh, the health department and the chest clinics cannot do uh, adequate, uh, anywhere close to adequate uh, uh, um, TB treatment for latent infection without the help of other partners. And I think the, the, the schools are very important partners. And in my impression, we're not utilizing the schools as much. Uh, what are the challenges and obstacles to utilizing schools to treat latent TB more than we are actually doing today? Oh, go ahead. Um, I know for us here at Lattimore, we were doing more through the schools, and one of the obstacles tends to be that the parents are a little reluctant to sign the permission to have the DOT done in school. So what we've worked out with some of the schools um, where the worker would meet the child before school began at the school to DOT the child, but we really rely on the school nurses sometimes to work with the family to really elicit their assistance with getting the DOT done in the school? Yeah, I think, you know, schools are for education. I mean, they don't look at themselves as healthcare, and you know. So there's some reluctance. And nurses, my sister is a school nurse in Brooklyn, 
And I can't tell you how busy they are. I mean, she tells me. Yeah. So they can see up to 60 kids a day with all sorts right. of, of, of conditions. I, it's a very difficult job. Right. And, and um, you know, for them, they and they do a terrific job, but it's, they're often the front line. They, you know, they, we always right. talk about first-line uh, responders. I think you have to include school nurses as first-line right. responders. Um, and so sometimes distinguishing some of this stuff can be very, very difficult amongst all the other things, especially young kids. I mean, they get this influenza. There's a ton of things that they can get. So it's often, I think, it's difficult. As, as to DOT, I don't know, Lillian can speak better to the to right. delivering that in schools, and I think it's a good place to deliver it, it because I think children often, in a lot of ways, especially as they get a little older, they'll listen to a school nurse where they won't, you know, and you don't want to get the um, friction between the parent and the child. Right. Um, so it does, it is, I agree with you, Al, it, it is very important, but essentially I think schools see themselves as delivering education. That's number one through a hundred. And then anything else they can deliver, they'll try, but it's not their main emphasis. We have a question from the field. Um, the question essentially is, is, is the IGRA appropriate to use in children less than five years old? Yeah, well, we talked about that. It, the, there's not a lot of evidence yet. Um, I think in the situations that we talked about, in other words, if you're really concerned that there is disease there and, you, and the TST, for whatever reason, you don't feel is adequate, yes, you can use it. Um, I don't think the parameters have been truly set for children, especially under two, but under five, too. But I, I, I use it often, especially if I really suspect that there's disease. Um, and often, even if that's not determined, and I still suspect disease, I'll go ahead and, and, and treat for it. But it, it certainly more often than not is helpful um, um, in the progression. But, yes, you can use it. Um, you have to use it with a certain caveat. And you probably should speak to people who are very experienced using it when and interpreting results. I just wanted – this is Karen. I just wanted to um – Thank, thank Dr. Wanger and Lillian um, for their presentations and Dr. L for his questions because in, in doing the and listening and doing the presentation, uh, it became evident that we don't provide the school nurses with the risk assessment tool, and we need to do that. So coming um, coming out in August with this packet will be the risk assessment tool, and it'll also be on our website. So, and I concur with Peter that. Uh, School nurses are so busy that it's difficult to find a quiet place, a quiet time to do this. And we have to really focus more on the cases who are really, we really want to get treated. We'd like to have everything. One time in Hudson County, we had 350 kids on DOT, LTBI, in the schools throughout Hudson County. And it was fabulous. But it was, um, you know, it's difficult for many school nurses to incorporate this into their day. Also, uh, be aware that the Global TV Institute is on social media. Uh, you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And uh, also, uh, YouTube and iTunes, uh, you can use those resources to get the latest uh, updates and resources. Dr. Wanger? Yeah, I just want to make one comment. For those with, uh, um, like, uh, what do you smartphones and tabs, which is probably everybody. Um, the CDC has some great apps. They have a latent TB infection app. I mean, it's you download it, and it honestly, it, it answers almost any question you might have about latent TB. It's really, really very good. The uh, CDC.gov, they have very good resources, but they actually have apps just exclusively for this. So there is one for latent TB, and it's very good. So I would recommend just download it on your phone, and there it is. Also, that CDC site, you know, it, it kind of lays out the, the population risk factors and the, and the medical risk factors for, for latent TB, but, uh, and that we rely on those resources heavily as well when we uh, provide guidance. But also, let me say that, you know, finally, uh, don't forget that the New Jersey uh, Medical School 
and the Global Institute provides medical consultation services, and that number is provided, 1-800-4-TB-DOCS. Um, if you have any questions regarding medical consultation anywhere here in the Northeast region, it's a good resource. And finally, you know, I just want to thank all the presenters today for sharing their experiences with us. And uh, if nobody has anything else, that will conclude today's conference. Thank you again for your participation.